Hi everybody, just wanted to talk to you a little bit about J.J. Johnson's trombone playing and some things that I've learned trying to emulate his trombone playing. To get right to it, I'm going to be talking about four things. Air, slide technique, articulation, and the mind slash ear. So just so you guys know, this isn't everything there is to his trombone playing. There's a lot more that I'm not going to be talking about, partially because I don't know if you guys like this sort of thing. If you do, please comment below. Let me know if there's certain things you'd like to know. Hopefully I know about it. The second reason is because I don't know everything there is to his trombone playing. I didn't meet him. I haven't heard him live in person. I've known people who have, but I personally haven't, unfortunately. So these are just the four topics that I'm going to be covering today just to kind of help you guys out a little bit and maybe you won't take every single thing from here. It won't work for you, but maybe if you can take one or two things from here, then I'd call this video successful. So to get to it, first of all is his air. So when we talk about air, there's a lot of different mechanics to it that I'm not going to be explaining extensively. This includes embouchure, aperture, your tongue position, uh, breathing properly, letting the air flow, not being tight, relaxed, but I would just put that all under air. And hopefully you can kind of hear it by my examples today and JJ's own playing. So one aspect to air that I do want to cover is intonation. JJ's intonation was pretty spot on, maybe not perfectly in tune like an A440, but it was pretty solid enough to where his lines were transcribable. He wasn't sliding in between notes very much, at least not on purpose. And if he did, then it was pretty obvious that he was doing so. Maybe like some kind of little scoop that he does or a fall. So another thing that falls into air is the shape of his note, which kind of ties into intonation as well. It's kind of like a block. It's not kind of slidey or anything. Uh, for example, like he's not doing this sort of thing. At least not like that, but it was more probably like this. So some of the classical training that I had basically one of the exercises we did was to try to get your notes to sound like blocks, just to visualize it a certain way. Instead of like something like this, where the maybe the intonation of the note kind of starts and then finally gets full and the core is full uh, and then kind of dies off at the end, you want to think about blocks. <laughs> It's like when you hit a piano, the beginning of the note is already in tune. Bum, ba. It's right there. It's not wa, va. I mean, it decays a little bit, but think about the same front and end on the note. So, of course, you're not going to play jazz like that necessarily. But it's a start. Just kind of, I guess you can say, jazz it up, kind of make it funky a little bit. Uh, I'll play that line that you heard at the beginning. Very clear, as opposed to something like this. I don't know, that was kind of close too, but to me... That's not what I intended to play cleanly. Anyway, so that's uh, shape. That's another thing that is under the air category, which also ties into his clarity. Everything that JJ played was very transcribable, very clear. Maybe on faster tempos like the tune J, which is where that line is from that you had just heard, but at a much lower tempo. Maybe on some stuff like that, there might be one or two things here or there, but... If you listen back, it's pretty dang clear what he's playing. So on to the next thing, slide technique. His technique basically, as far as I know, I didn't, like, again, I didn't talk to him. But from the videos, if you watch videos of him, I've talked to a couple of people about JJ's slide technique and his fingers and his wrist. It's more about a 
throwing and catching the slide. Uh, you want to have relaxed wrist and even like fingers. So, for example, if you're going from first through fourth, you don't really have to move your forearm that much. It's mostly in the hand. It depends on the size of your hands, of course, and your arms. <laughs> All that I can do with very minimal movement. And outside of that, then of course you have to reach out a little bit, but it's very efficient. Uh, another thing was that um, he was very relaxed at this playing. Not only his wrists and his hands, but also his shoulders and his face. So he can maximize everything for the musical part of it. He's very efficient in that he only moves when he has to. He's not doing all this kind of thing, you know, like a lot of guys do. I mean, I myself kind of rock sometimes or go from side to side for certain reasons that we won't discuss in this video. But um, he's very efficient with his movement and his slide. Uh, one thing I did notice as a side note is that his arms are longer for his body as he seems to have long arms as opposed to someone like me who has shorter arms. So if I were to sit there and with my arms to my side and relax like he is, the horn would be down here. If I picked it up, it would be up here just because my forearms are too short. It would have to be up here and a little closer to me. So what I tend to do a lot of the times is kind of do this. I've tried to relax my plane over the last few years. Also my forehead, any kind of tension that I might have in my body. So the next big thing is articulation. There's a few things here. Some things that I've noticed is that to get the sound he gets on a lot of the single tonguing that I do when trying to play like him, I have to not do tongue. I can't go do 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 or two two two. It's like a almost like a th the the. It's in between a the and a t. <laughs> so my tongue is actually in between my teeth a little bit. So here's a, like a do or two tongue. It's a little smoother, but this is like the mix between the tongue and the, the tongue. It's a little harsher and more rhythmic and clear as well, I'd say. So that's one thing I had to learn in my playing. Actually, it's funny because when I was studying classical music, I would actually do tongue everything or two tongue everything. And when I started moving my tongue a little lower on the teeth, you know, almost to where it's like in between my two teeth. I started to get a fatter sound in front to my note. I would get something like this. As opposed to something with a two or do, where the tongue is higher on my teeth and almost to my gums. The difference is subtle. So one other side fact to his articulation is did DJ Johnson single tongue everything? Did he doodle tongue everything? Or did he double tongue everything? Or did he do a combination of any of those? I really don't know. I know uh, Javier Nero, a great trombone player now in New York City, did his dissertation on multiple tonguing and he was talking about what JJ did and I think he believes that JJ Johnson did a double tongue. And actually this is my main form of multiple tonguing. But if you want to see a previous video of what I do for fast playing and multiple tonguing, I'll link it down below in the description. So check that out if, you, if you're interested. Okay, so Javier believes that he double tongued. I talked to Mike Dees and a few years ago he thought that JJ Johnson doodle tongue some of the really fast playing that he did maybe like a harder doodle tongue possibly i don't know uh, i know i've talked to people and they think jj johnson single tongue everything there's cats out there that can single tongue extremely fast my single tongue is pretty slow but um whatever it is what i do to emulate his playing is double tongue i am working on my doodle tongue right now a uh, harder doodle tongue just for clarity's sake it's just the sound i have in my head so this sound that i have in my head ties into the next final topic that we're going to talk about, which is the mind slash ear. So every player is different and has a different background in what they listened to growing up. It could have been all trombone players, it could have been non-trombone players, it could have been classical trombone players, classical musicians, rock, 
But I do know a couple of influences that JJ had. One of them was Lester Young, I think maybe in terms of his sound and phrasing. And another one, of course, if you've read uh, Miles Davis's book, it was Charlie Parker and some of the Bebop Cats at the time. So that's what JJ heard. I hear different things right now. I'm wearing a John Coltrane shirt. John Coltrane is a big part of my musical life and my mind. Of course, I don't play tenor saxophone. I can't get around like him. A lot of people can't, but... I mean, his sound, there's like rumors about his legendary sound. Of course, this is not a video about John Coltrane, so I'll stop myself there. But the influences I had versus influence J.J. Johnson had are going to inform our playing. So no matter how much I try to sound like J.J. Johnson, when I go to improvise and do my own solos, I'm going to have my own influences. So for me, it's probably Coltrane, Charlie Parker, J.J. Johnson, of course. And a lot of trombone players, Frank Rosalino, Carl, early on, I don't necessarily get around the horn like they do, but it's in the back of my mind. It's somewhere in there subconsciously lying there. Uh, just basically everyone you've heard and you've studied, transcribed, even just listening to something over and over thousands of times will um, creep inside your plane. So those are the four big topics that I wanted to discuss with you. Uh, air, slide technique, articulation, and the mind slash ear. And again, these are not exclusive, and by no means everything there is to know about J.J. Johnson's playing. These are just a few things I wanted to talk to you guys about. To wrap everything up and hopefully make a little more sense of it, I'm going to play part of J.J. Johnson's solo on the tune J. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video, y'all. If you like this video, please like and share. If you want to see more content like this, comment down below and subscribe to my channel. Let me know if there's certain feedback, certain things you didn't like about it. Don't get too harsh, but uh, you can go ahead and leave me some feedback down below in the comment section. And uh, until next time, thanks again.